Hello and welcome to Friends with Deficits. I'm your host, Adam Sultan. And it's time for uh, our usual programming. If you'd been listening to the last 30 episodes in the month of November, if you're on that current time zone, uh, we were participating in Napod Pomo, which is National Podcast Post Month, which meant I uh, dropped an episode every day for the month of November, 30 episodes. You can hear them at our website, friendswithdeficitspodcast.com, or on Spotify, I've made a playlist, uh, YouTube, the Friends with Deficits channel. In any case, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of craziness. And now we're back to dealing with people and their things. And my next friend is Tracy Hayes. She's a yoga therapist and has been dealing with glossopharyngeal neuralgia, if you can believe that. Don't know what it is? Well, listen up and you'll hear all about it and all about Tracy. Without further ado, here's Tracy Hayes. Where do, you t- where do you say you teach yoga? I teach privately oh. in my house, cool. and I work one-on-one with people. I'm a yoga therapist. I'm working with people's anxiety issues, PTSD issues. I am also really knowledgeable about spinal issues because my spine is a disaster. <laughs> That's another thing that I work on a lot. Uh, but, you know, sometimes somebody's just like, I can't, I can't find any classes that I can keep up with anymore. I'm not enjoying, you know, heated flow anymore. I need something different. People will just come to me because they want to practice and they want to not stop even though they're having a hard time in public classes. Uh, with my clients, they all know that I deal with chronic illnesses. And so it's a safe way for me to work. Yeah. You know? So maybe we should just jump into <laughs> chronic pain. And I don't know. With you. Yeah, if you want. Yeah. Um, I can barely pronounce if let alone remember, glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Yeah, that. Glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Yeah. It's a neurological disease. It's a pain condition. The condition is very rare. So there's not a whole lot of research to look at, but generally it's caused by, they think, um, an impediment to the glossopharyngeal nerve that comes out of your cranium, and an artery will grow over that, and so it'll create an impingement, just like if you slip a disc, Mm -hmm. and, you know, part of your disc might be squished a little bit by your vertebrae. Mm -hmm. It's the same principle that an artery somewhere or some type of thing has shifted in your brain, you know, and they've just sort of put pressure on the nerve, which begins to create a pain signal that the glossopharyngeal nerve goes into the right side of the interior of your head. So it's the right side of your tongue. It's only this nerve is only on the right side. Well, no, the nerve is bilateral, but yeah. it divides in half, and the right side goes to the right side, and the left side goes to the left side. Okay. They don't start crossing until down there. So it's my right glossopharyngeal nerve, and it's impinged supposedly somewhere, although they can't see that on any imaging. Sometimes you can, sometimes mm. you can't with the, this disease. So it makes uh, pain or tingling for me in the right side of my tongue, the right side of my jaw, the inside of my, like, roof of my mouth, behind the eye, and uh, deep into the ear. (laughs) And it hurts really bad. (laughs) It hurts really bad, and it, like, doesn't stop. And so... When When did you first discover this? I had gotten back from Costa Rica. I had gone away to Costa Rica for a year. It was, like, 2011. And I came back, and it was 2012, and, and two things hit me. I, I started dealing with some major digestive disorders, and I started dealing with these headaches. In and relation to Costa Rica? I don't know. I am, we've never been able to draw any kind of connection, although possibly. I wasn't sick while I was there at all. Anyway, uh, the headaches started as well. And at that point, they just felt like regular headaches. I, I, I didn't know what to make of them. There was headaches. It was strange because I started taking, you know, Advils and things like that, and they just weren't really responding. It wasn't responding. And they would just sort of last and wipe me out. And at that point, I hadn't really experienced headaches like that. Do you know if it was similar to a migraine? Well, 
There was a neurologist who originally tried to diagnose me with migraines, and I was like, migraines don't happen in your throat, migraines don't happen in your tongue. My right side of my tongue, I had a metallic taste in my mouth, like as though, you know, like the feeling you get with, you know, aluminum foil on a, on a filling right. or something is Licking really, a battery, it's like, oh, why am I feeling that in my mouth? And there's like a taste. And, um, and there's a tingle on the right side of my tongue, like my, like my tongue almost starts to feel like leathery to me, like to, to other people, it wouldn't feel that way. But to me, it's like I lose something in there. And all of a sudden, it's like this, just this piece of meat that's tingling in my mouth is the right side of my tongue. It's almost like a dismemberment, but it's not. Uh, and then um, the pain in the throat is, is just severe and up into the head and back and behind. It's as though there's just this, this ball of pain emanating out. It's just like this horrible emanating pain. I thought originally maybe there was possibly some sort of creature burrowing in and making a home for itself. But it turns out <laughs> luckily <laughs> that, that doesn't happen a lot. So after I got back from Costa Rica and had left working in politics and was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life, not just live in the jungle and eat mangoes. And then, yeah, this set in. And uh, so that was when um, the um, Affordable Care Act was enacted. And I was able to get insurance. And I got really good coverage. And it was not expensive at all. It was totally doable. And that allowed me to start going to doctors for this headache thing, <laughs> which, you know, that was this whole long process of getting misdiagnosed repeatedly. You, you start to get treated like maybe this is a psychological or you're, you're resisting, you know, your diagnoses. You're, you know, you don't, you don't trust your doctors. You're, you're having a problem, you know, just uh, listening to what they're saying. And you're like, well, can you show me where a migraine would happen in my throat? Like, is there any literature anywhere that you can show me where migraines will be happening in your throat? Because that's where they're happening for me. <laughs> like, yeah. They're in my tongue. When I was trying to, to get my, my neurologist to, to talk to me about it, he was like, listen, I deal with the head. I don't deal with the throat. And I was like, well, this is all related. It's your glossopharyngeal nerve that <laughs> sends sensation to all of those areas inside of your head. And, um, he didn't, he couldn't, he didn't catch it. What I have is rare. People don't see it. Once I, I, I got diagnosed actually by a different doctor, a ear, nose, and throat doctor, who said he had seen somebody with the same thing maybe six, six years ago. Maybe I had this thing. And he gave me a prescription for an epilepsy medication that is, I guess, some sort of a nerve blocker. And uh, said, so take this to your, your neurologist see what he says. And he said glossopharyngeal neurology on the paper. So I took it to the neurologist who I had already been fighting with, who already didn't like me because I didn't believe him. So I showed up in his office with this like, hey, okay, what do you think about this disease? Could this be what I have? And he was like, hmm, well, maybe, but you're still having migraines. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't let go. <laughs> Can't let it go, can you? So I was like, okay, and we, and we talked about it a little bit, and he knew the textbook definition of the disease, which by that point I had already read everything I could find, and the textbook definition of the disease is one that most people don't seem to have. <laughs> the textbook definition is, defines glossopharyngeal neuralgia as a pain disease that is characterized by electric sharp pains that might pulse through you like a lightning bolt. And you might have little episodes where you have three shocks or five shocks or seven shocks. And they might happen once an hour or they might happen once a day or they might happen once a week. Or they might not happen for a while and then happen like 20 or 30 times a day. And from what I can tell from the people who I've been able to communicate with through social media who have this disease, who have their little Facebook group, like a, most have more of a, um, it's like a long-term persistent pain that has a volume knob rather than something that comes and goes like lightning. So then, so, but the neurologist did a good thing for me. Um, he gave me a different medication that was less toxic for the body. 
and was like, try this first. Because the epilepsy medications, now you're in a, an arena where you have to take something every day at a dosage that is high enough to make them want to test your organ function every three months to make sure that you're not straining your organs too much when you take this medication that will be the thing that allows you to function in your life. Because <laughs> at that point I couldn't, you know. Getting, getting to the point where I had an actual understanding of what was physically happening inside my body was hard. And there was a lot of reluctance from a lot of people and a lot of doctors wanted to rely on the knowledge that they knew they had and when that didn't work they kind of were like, well, you don't have pituitary cancer like we thought you did. And you're like, okay, what next? And they're kind of like, we don't know, like, you're probably fine. And you're like, well, that's, that can't be the end of the story. Like, I'm going to go home with this pain. And the thing that brought me here to begin with, that came out negative. So let's, what's next? You know, doctors don't like those questions. It was about 11 months of seeing different doctors to get to the ENT that, that gave me that diagnosis. But and then it was about like a couple days before I was on a medication that gave me some pain relief. The pain at that point was so exhausting that I was useless. Like I was totally useless. I had nothing to offer. It was a strange and dark time. I shifted from being an extreme extrovert to being completely isolated. And the only people I saw really were people who were like, hey, like, can we come over? Like, are you okay? And every now and then you could rally to go out to something, but going to anything that involved music or dancing, which were the things I did all the time, where my friends were, where, you know, what I loved to do, I couldn't do because it sucks to listen to loud music when your head is full of pain. <laughs> it just totally blows, you know, it's just, you, and the, you know, you, you can try to rally, you know, you can try to be like, well, maybe if I, smoke a lot of pot and, you know, had drink a few beers, you know, my substance in, um, use increased for sure because it did help with pain. Yeah. So the, the shift from like being somebody who was absolutely comfortable everywhere and not understanding social anxiety or feeling like I couldn't function in social situations and to, to, to going from like, I don't know if I can pull this off. I don't know if I can be in public. <laughs> like, I don't know if I can be around people. I've got nothing to talk about except for my glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Did I tell you about my glossopharyngeal neuralgia? <laughs> Do you want to hear about my medication? Like, I wish you had interviewed me then. Like it would have like given me so much satisfaction. <laughs> To have somebody like really listening, you know, because it was just like so boring and pervasive and everything to try, you know, it's like you're in this much pain, you're completely disabled, you got to dig yourself out of that hole. It's what you've got to do. I was not actively suicidal, but I was definitely experiencing having thoughts about if this is going to be my life, I'm going to have to take it, that, that there will be no other choice. Was there any prognosis given to you? Yeah, so, so what my disease does is worsen over time, supposedly. Now, the, the gabapentin that they gave me, uh, they wanted me to take 2,800 milligrams once a day. That was the goal amount. So you divide it into taking it three times a day. So you would like 900, 900, 900, right? This stuff, whoo, it, it made the pain go away. Yeah, I took it and it, and it made things, uh, so much better. I, I, I woke up really happy for the first time in, in possibly years. Um, it's a fun-ish kind <laughs> of drug, right? I woke, so woke up really happy and like, wow, something's going to work. Something's going to work to take this pain away. That's not a danger to me. And uh, I worked up to the 900 milligram level and then I started experiencing memory problems and language problems Loss of access to my mental functioning. It slowed me down. It made me slower. So you're going to add that to having social anxiety from being sick and, you know, unable. Now, now when I'm dealing with people, I have my anxiety about like having been out of the world for a year and can't talk. 
<laughs> like yeah. don't have words, you know, it's like they're little simple words like toast, you know, like, <laughs> nothing important. Just couldn't get the words out of my mouth because the medication slows down your brain functioning. And that's one of the ways that it works for you. It slows down your pain response and your nerves and also other things, you know, just firing in general. And yeah, balance. Um, is another issue. It makes you groggy. It makes you tired. It can make you kind of lethargic. And there's a whole list of lovely side effects. Uh, one of those was, um, it was like you know, diluted sense of well being or, you know, mm -hmm. like unrealistic or, you know, <laughs> some word like that. And I was like, oh, that's what I felt that first day when I woke up. Huh. I felt that. I felt that very unrealistic well, sense wait, of Wait, how is that not a. How is that a side effect and not a result of the medication, like a positive result? Well, I've had that question. Um, it might be that if you're taking it for different reasons, that particular effect may not happen. Like if you're somebody who perhaps doesn't have a pain condition, so you didn't get pain relief, you got some subtler thing. But on, a, on another note, the gabapentin is being used for depression treatment now. So it's an off-label use of that medication. And I know people who have used it that way. I know people who have used it to come off of opiates um, as, a, as a way to um, better deal with, with withdrawal symptoms and pain mm -hmm. associated with that process. Um, it's used for a lot of things, but it has a host of side effects that become a monster. And they wanted me, you know, at, that, at the point where I was losing my language and losing my balance and... You know, now I, now I have to take naps at work because I'm on a medication that makes me tired. <laughs> so I'm not in as much pain as I'm, you know, amping up the medication, but I'm losing other functionality. So it's like, there you are. Now you're stuck in this thing. So now comes acupuncture and now comes cranial sacral therapy. Is there a cure for this? There is an operation called a microvascular decompression. And with a microvascular decompression, they go into uh, the deep uh, cranial uh, sort of area where the nerves are connecting in. And then they, they remove the artery, and then they wrap it with a Teflon sleeve. And it's considered serious brain surgery it has a six to 18 month recovery period. It has a 50% chance of working and of having side effects like the inability to swallow on one side of your throat, possible deafness on one side of your head, um, cerebral spinal fluid leaks from the surgery itself. I take it you did not elect to have this surgery. Well, so, when I had, when I started taking the gabapentin, I got my diagnosis. I joined the Facebook groups. I started talking to people. I was like, I am having that surgery. This is going to suck, but I am absolutely going to do that. And I uh, started paying a lot of attention to the conversations that people were having. There, it's a quite active community. I think because. You're so desperate to know something about your disease. You know, one thing I wanted to mention with my neurologist that I didn't include is I asked him, what do you know about my disease? And he was like, nothing really. And I was like, okay, do you know any neurologist in Austin or the area that I might be able to go to to have, find somebody who has more knowledge about my disease? And he was like, no. And I said, okay, are you willing in any way to help me navigate and learn about this? Because I don't know where to turn. And he said, no. <laughs> oh. And I was like, okay, like, I'm never going to come back here. Like, you know this. We have just, like, we're done, right? So where are you at with that now, the, the idea of the surgery? Well, now I don't, now... I will fight like hell to not have it. And that's kind of what I've done. Um, and I've gotten myself medication free, which was a lot of work. I'm off my, I'm off the medications that were causing all of the side effects. And it was through meditation, acupuncture, you know, my yoga practice, um, 
cranial sacral therapy ha- helped a lot, and uh, learning how to work with what I have going on. Um, I do take my medication sometimes. I do have flare-ups, and I don't know if I have actually gained some conscious control over my pain reactions or if it's just an absolute coincidence. I'm open to either answer, really. But I did that work, and it seems like um, I've been able to change the way my physiology is working with whatever's happening in my brain. However, I do feel very aware that at any point that pain can flare up again and I might not be able to get it under control. And at that point, if I'm weighing being on medications that take my functionality away and the possibility for a surgery to give me most of it back, I probably would start looking at surgery. I don't know. So now, are you basically pain-free as far as this is concerned? I always have about a level two to three type of pain going on in my head. That's always there. And you don't get the symptoms, the, the shocking kind of symptoms you describe? No, I don't. No, I don't. So it's just a constant low volume. Yeah. And... There are times when it can feel like it's completely gone, but if I check in with myself, I know it's there. I can feel it. So I just have a different, like my consciousness, I think, just is adjusted to read a certain level as normal. Yeah. Um, it doesn't prevent me from having fun, though, which is one of the things that matter. It doesn't prevent me from being able to dance with friends or go hear music or... Enjoy a day at the Springs. I mean, that was out of the question, too. It was quiet activities, you know, those sucked, too, you know. But, like, you know, they weren't as out of the question. Yeah. And you didn't have anything anything like this earlier when you were younger? Or anything? No. Was this no. straight out of Costa Rica? It wasn't straight out, but, yeah, it was, it was shortly after. It was within, you know, the first year of coming back. Um. I had some digestive issues that set in first, and then the headaches set in after that. Do they know what the causes are? No. There are people all over the map that have it. Um, It's more common, they say, in women over their 40s. And in those situations, it has to do with just your brain just grows arteries that go places, and sometimes they go places too much, (laughs) too hard, you know? I thought like artery growth was sort of a fixed deal in some way, you know. I mean, your cells yeah, are Yeah, no, I, I guess but... they just kind of sometimes they explore, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll so. have to talk to an expert. Find me one. I looked online. It seemed like there's a lot. There's doctors who've written papers and there's, you know. Yeah, but none of the doctors that practice in Austin are reading those papers. Oh, okay. Like, that's... You need a practical expert, somebody to help you with yours. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just looking for somebody for some extra info for the podcast. That's, oh, <laughs> that's, oh. just, that's just well, myself. Well, here, here. Yeah. I mean, okay, so there's a Dr. Linksy in mm-hmm. California. He's the one who's the, the go-to guy. If you're going to have this surgery, like, the, you know, there's like shrines to Dr. Linksy. Like, mm. You know, he's performing these surgeries very successfully and pulling them off, but it requires you being able to fly out to California. You spend, I think, like a week there. And he's not in network, which is a whole other thing. Like, coverage for this is weird. So what would you ask Dr. Linksy? Is it? Yeah, my, my, my name is Dr. Mark Linsky. I'm a professor of neurological surgery at the University of California, Irvine. I would want to know what he thinks is the biggest obstacle for him to be able to make that surgery safer and more effective? Well, I think that the key thing is to get to the patient before they've crossed a line between reversible healable damage and now some component of irreversible permanent damage. So the real issue is awareness of the condition, proper diagnosis, and early referral to a specialist who can deal with it. This is a highly specialized operation. It's not something like a gallbladder resection or an appendicitis operation where things are codified and where different surgeons will have roughly equivalent uh, results. This really depends on the surgeon. But in the proper hands, uh, somebody properly trained and very experienced in the the condition and the surgery, 
Uh, the success rate for being pain-free is about 80%, with a maybe 10% chance of recurrence over 10 to 20 years. And the other 20% of patients that aren't pain-free are divided in half. Half of them were much better, but not perfect, and the other half where it's as if you didn't operate for whatever reason it didn't work. What's the future for for this? What do you need to overcome in order to be able to make this, advance this? Well, the, uh, the major advances that I think need to happen are in the form of research. We need to understand much better why it is that people who get this syndrome have normal blood vessels touching or pressing or pulsating against their nerves lead to loss of myelin. And that's a biological differential susceptibility, and that's where most of the research has to be done. Or are there even ways of, of preventing this from uh, needing surgery uh, going forward in the future? That, that's where the work has to be. It also seems really difficult to diagnose, from what I understand. Right. Well, glossopharyngeal neuralgia is not the only neuralgic cranial nerve uh, syndrome caused by vascular compression. The most common is actually an extremely rare condition itself. That's called trigeminal neuralgia, and that affects the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. And in women, where it's most common, the incidence is only six per 100,000 per year. And glossopharyngeal neuralgia is more than 10 times more rare. So you can imagine how unusual it would be for a board-certified neurosurgeon to encounter patients like this, or even neurologists uh, to encounter patients like this. These are rare patients. I'm a lucky one, from what I can tell. Uh, people do go into what they call remission, which is possibly where I'm at, remission. But... Uh, it can come back really hard. It is true that 50% of patients will have remissions up to six months in length, but it always comes back, and it always comes back worse in terms of frequency and severity. And unfortunately, that's the case. We have medicines that can help. These are seizure medicines, not pain medicines. Um, even if the medicines work initially, the patients will describe to you that it requires over time a larger and larger dose of the same medicine to get the same effect until they get to the point where they, either the pain breaks through or they can't tolerate the medicines. So I, so, I, so I was taking the 900 milligrams of gabapentin and starting to have the side effects and starting to realize that this was going to be a difficult way to live. And so I started working harder on um, prayer and meditation uh, with relationship to my pain. Um, I had a wonderful relationship that I was developing at that time with a uh, acupuncturist, Genevieve Sprinkle. And her and I traded yoga for acupuncture. And what that did is, is it gave me another client, which my clients gave me a reason to get out of bed and focus and try to overcome pain. I had never really um, gone through a long-term relationship with an acupuncturist for a therapeutic reason. You know, they, they put the needles all over you. Uh, there were definitely places where I felt like, oh, those are the needles I want. So I want those needles. And I started craving acupuncture for my pain. The experience of getting getting acupuncture and lying on the table and, and feeling movement in my body and, and finding ways to work with and shift my reactions and my responses was an amazing gift. And um, I think that that is what enabled me to begin to wean myself off the gabapentin, which I did sort of by starting to realize I wasn't in as much, much pain, you know, so it drove me to try harder to get a handle on things, uh, not without medication, but without so much, you yeah. know, uh, my goal at that point wasn't really to get off of it. It was just to, like not get on more. Did you say you're off it now or you take it as needed? It's, I take it as needed now, which they really don't want you to do. And I'm like, you know what? It's great that way. It's so nice that way. It's, it's so nice to, you know, have that little help and uh, not have to be on it every day. Could you have done this this interview? Were you in the midst of? Well, strong? I could have done this interview, but it would have been darker. There would have been no humor. I mean, I would have tried, but it would have fallen flat. <laughs> I was I was not able to mask my pain. I w it was very difficult to 
to be present and not miserable with people. Yeah. Which is why I isolated. Because like I said, I had nothing to offer. I had pain. Like Did you have friends who thought you just had this weird personality shift or something going from... Um, I, well, see, I told people about it. But the thing was, is like, if, if you run into a friend and you have so many things to talk about and what's going on and how's your summer and you share things that are happening in your life, like stuff, you know, that you might think they find interesting or, or you give them feedback when they're talking about things that you find interesting. You have your feedback for them that right. is kind and helpful and something. And I had nothing. Like I could barely hear what people were saying because my pain was in the way and I could barely find anything I wanted to talk about because all that was there was pain. It was rare that that wasn't the, the case until medication. And then once medication came, then you have like the post-traumatic stress <laughs> of having gone through that, which is now the focal point of like, and now I'm learning how to live without pain. And now I'm trying to learn how to like be present with people again and all the way through that you're drugged when you come out the other side and the pain is gone then you have to start looking at who you are now what that experience was for that person that existed before the pain experience and then what got broken down what got destroyed what got talking talked to within you you know mm -hmm. where did the talking to happen what did you learn like what did you lose of yourself? What, what died in that? And, and what's going to take its place? Like when you haven't figured out what's going to take its place yet, you're just dealing with the, the death, like, right? The grief. Yeah. You know, yeah. so now you're better. You didn't die. It's right. like my dad's house that just burned down. He didn't die, but he lost a lot. There was a grief, there's a grief there that, yeah. you know, must be properly addressed. Did you lose uh, any relationships? I did. I did. I lost some relationships. I also learned a lot about some relationships. I didn't lose them, but they shifted. There were, there were times where I had people who, who said they were going to be there for me and who let me down. And there were times where people showed up for me and were there for me who I never would have expected. And Learning that that's how it's going to go down is a really wonderful gift. It's a good thing to know. Like I try to tell people that who are dealing with illnesses is like, not everybody knows how to have a good side bed, you know, good bedside manner. Not everybody is going to know how to come be your nurturer, be your friend when what they know how to do with you is smoke pot and drink beer then all of a sudden they're like oh you know you've been friends for years but you're generally not in these really uncomfortable situations together where you just want the lights out and quiet you know because it's just dark you know but then you'll have your friends who are like hey you know what i miss you if i come over can we just sit in your kitchen and have tea you know and those people will come for you you know yeah. so and being able to learn to love both of those friends equally and not feel abandoned was a, was an obstacle I had to go over. You know, that was a good thing to learn. Seems like sometimes relationships should get that stuff out of the way s sooner than later. Yeah. You know, Hey, I'm not going to be the one that comes over when you're, you know, when you're dealing with your chronic illnesses, but if you want to go camping, <laughs> 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 but not everybody can handle you know, the, where you go when, cause when you're dealing with these mortal questions and you're afraid and you're like, you cry, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're afraid, you're losing your functionality, you're losing your body. You don't know why, you know, it's, it's, it's intense. Um, but one thing, uh, I learned, like I got humbled, you know, the disease created a humility for me that, um, I had to recognize that I had very little compassion for anybody who truly has invisible illnesses, illnesses that cannot be seen. I did not get it. I did not understand it. It did not make sense to me to see somebody who looked healthy, but then would say that they felt bad. So going through what I've gone through, 
I instantly, it's like the, there's a world of people and experience that has opened up to me, you know, that I can now contribute to and benefit from and like grow compassion for this stuff and understanding what the needs are there and, you know, how important it is to create, I don't know, a space for people to, to be able to figure their thing out and, and to live their lives even when they're compromised and, you know, get support even when it's like really uncertain what that means. And yeah. That answers the question. My obligatory podcast question is always about what are the benefits of whatever you're going through? I don't know that I would have lived an unhappy life if I didn't have to empathize with people who had invisible illnesses, like I will now for the rest of my life, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know how bad it was for me before. I can't say that I'm like, Oh, improvement. What I can say is that there's more, more love, more space for love, but that also comes with its own challenges. Right. Cause that can also mean more work. <laughs> I think that is our, our work <laughs> right? on this planet. That's our work, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I hope that worked out for you. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it, and I enjoyed having Tracy Hayes as my guest. And a special visit from Dr. Linsky. Very good. Well, I appreciate you getting the word out to people about the condition and making sure that uh, that awareness is spread. And if you'd like to help spread the word about Friends with Deficits, Tell your friends and be sure to subscribe to us uh, at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. You can also sign up for our newsletter at friendswithdeficitspodcast.com. And if you'd like to support the show by making a small monthly or one-time contribution, check out patreon.com slash friendswithdeficits. Until next time, I'm Adam Sultan. Enjoy your work. <laughs>